I know it's been a while, but we are moving on with our ITF Plus studies, and we are moving on to Module 2, Unit 4, which is all about using databases. So in the last module, we talked about programming, right? So that's more of like our business logic. Now we need to talk about where data is actually stored. Our objectives for this lesson are to talk about databases and kind of what their purpose is. We're gonna talk about this idea of relational methods or how do we have relationships between different pieces of data, okay? And how can we differentiate this between like an Excel file? You know, why not just use a spreadsheet? We're gonna talk about the differences and advantages of both in this module, okay? We're gonna talk about how users can um, interact with this data, whether that's directly or through using some type of programming logic. And then we're gonna talk about different um, application architecture modules. So this would be like, you know, tier one, tier two, tier, and so on and so forth. Um, and that's something that is on the ITF plus exam. So we're gonna kind of cover that towards the end as well. So when it comes to just databases as a whole, what you need to know is that data falls into columns and rows, okay? So what do we mean by that? Well, if you took a look at a spreadsheet, you have your rows that go across this way, and then your columns that go up and down, okay? So in a database, our columns are our fields and our rows are our records, okay? So what's you know, the biggest advantage of using SQL or using a database is to organize all of your data in a way that can be easily scaled. Again, you might start off with a small application and it might get a lot of popularity. And then next thing you know, you have a thousand users. So you need to find out, you know, how you can scale this once a lot more users come on. And that's where, you know, databases have been around for a really, really long time. And the great thing about databases is the fact that they do scale, but they also keep your data very, very organized, okay? So when it comes to an actual database, here's a couple things that you can do. You can create data, you can create tables, you can create things, you can import or input different pieces of information. Uh, storage, so it could just hold data for you. You have queries. A query is just like a search term. So when you go to Google and you type something in, that is a query, okay? So you can query that data as well. And then finally, you can run reports on our data, okay? So we can create data. We could import data that we have maybe from somewhere else. Our database can just store stuff for us. We can do queries and find specific information, or we can run reports on that data. Okay. So you might be used to uh, some type of data storage, uh, such as Excel spreadsheets or CSVs. Well, those data, those um, forms of data storage are not what we would call databases, okay? Those are just flat files. A flat file is something like a spreadsheet or a CSV in that everything is in one record, okay? So you have your one Excel spreadsheet, and even though you have rows and columns, that data isn't stored in a way that it relates to one another. And I'll show you an example um, in the coming slides about kind of those relationships and where that comes into play. But what you need to know for the test is that a flat file is something that is non-relational and it's like a CSV or an Excel spreadsheet. And if you don't know what a CSV is, if you look at our example here um, on the screen, we have our columns that are at the top and they're separated by a column, so or a comma. So first name, last name, first access, last access, course name, etc. And then below it, you have where those... Um, that those pieces of information will fall under those kind of headers, if you will. And CSVs are probably the easiest way to move data between a lot of different applications. They are the most common, okay? So when it comes to our databases, we can do things like determine, you know, what type of data goes into a certain column. So if we're going to have an address or a phone number or an email, we can set that as 
the type of information that's being input to make sure that we have clean data. And we'll get to it in a minute, but uh, when it comes to databases, you have garbage in, garbage out. So we wanna make sure that we are you know, doing as much time planning out our database as we are you know, in our overall project to make sure that that data is being put in there, that it is exactly what we want it to be. We wanna make sure that that data stays clean and organized, okay? So here are a couple things, um, a couple uh, vocabulary words, if you will, that you need to know, okay? So your RDBMS, that is your Relational Database Management System, okay? It's not really, that's not really like a term that I've seen used like in the industry, um, but it is your database system, whether that's SQL, whether that's Microsoft SQL, whether that is um, even Access, those are all the way, the, all of those are different names for tools that are your relational database management system. So if you're taking notes, so I would e explain what it is, relational database management system, this is how we're gonna manage our database. And some of those software titles include SQL Server, Oracle Database, MySQL, and Access, okay? So when we're working on our databases, we have this idea of, and I've said it a few times, this relationship, okay? And that relationship comes in the form of primary keys and, form, and foreign keys. And I'll show you an example here in a minute. But our primary key is kind of our unique value. Think of it like your social security number or a serial number for each um, each piece of information that we have or each row that we have, okay? And then the foreign key is something that is going to relate to someone else's primary key, okay? So if we look here at our example, we have our customer table. So Andrew Warren, his customer ID is AW178, okay? So that is one table. Well, in this case, we're doing a book lending system, okay? So we're going to have a table of all of our customers, a table of all of, all of the books that are available, and then we're going to have a lending table, okay? So we can see on our customer table, our customer ID, that is our primary key because that's our random value. And then you can see we have our book title. So we're going to bring that in with our customer ID. So that created a relationship between all of these tables. So if we ever wanted to see who, you know, rented the book Smelly Feet, well, now we'll see all of the customer IDs that will then tie back to customer names, okay? Or if we just wanted to see what type of books does Andrew Warren borrow, then we could just type in his um, information when we're building our query or building our report, and then we can see in the lending table which customer ID, and we would just sort by just his customer ID. So you can start to see where we're relating all of these different pieces of information. Think of it like one of those detective shows where you had like the little pins and they connected, you know, people to a murder or a theft. That's the same thing that we're doing here, okay? So when it comes to our data, like I said before, it's garbage in and garbage out. You want to make sure that you are having the best information come into your database so that way when you're doing these reports, you could have really, really good information that's coming out. It'll save time troubleshooting it and it'll provide your users with a better overall experience, okay? So when it comes to constraints, we want to make sure that if it's a phone number, then the, then the actual type of data, we make sure we list that in our um, relational database management software. Okay, We can go in there and say, this is a text input, or this is a phone number, or an email input. And with the more modern tools that are out there, it'll automatically enforce that when the user is trying to enter information in there. That'll help also help on kind of the cybersecurity side with what are called SQL injections. So we can make sure that our users aren't doing some of those um, common attacks, if you will, and we'll keep our users' information safe, okay? There's another thing we can, other things we can do by making sure that we have required fields, make sure that, you know, there's no blank, um, you know, obviously if we think it's important enough to put that information there, then we need to make sure that, 
you know, we require information to be put in. So like not being able to leave the phone number blank, for example, because we, we think that's important when we're designing how our application works. So you want to make sure that people can't just leave that blank. Okay. So there are a couple, when it comes to databases, um, you have a structured relational database, and that's going to be very defined of, you know, what goes here, what goes there. You have unstructured data, that's going to be like blobs of data or like documents, pictures, um, presentations, images, uh, stuff like that. Um, so that we don't really know like the size in which we're going to interpret. So that area of our database will be unstructured because we're not going to sure, sure if it's a video or a photo, whatever it might be. Okay. And then there's semi-structure where we might have a good idea of it. And if it's semi-structured, then we can have, maybe there's some metadata or some other information in that type of document that we can pull out. Um, but most of the time, in my experience, I've seen structured where we're very defined on our text information. And then the only section that's unstructured is like if there's a file upload section, okay? So a newer way of... Um, developing applications is this idea of no SQL or no SQL. Okay, so this is still a database. But what we're doing is we're just tying as you can see on the bottom right here, we have our um, values that are separated. So username zero one, and then it has that um, colon there and then Warren, then there's a comma. And then we have user 01 underscore first name, colon, Andy, comma. So we have this key value pair, okay? So when you're working with some more modern languages, especially web languages, a lot of them are going to use JSON, which is JavaScript object notation, okay? Where you see here on the right hand where it's NoSQL, we're just doing key value pairs, okay? Um, so we don't have these big relational databases. Instead, we just have the information that we need that's tied to the actual value. Um, so this is a little bit more lightweight, more for you know web applications and stuff like that. Uh, but there are still a lot of industry um, tools that are still using SQL, especially when it comes to like large data sets within companies. A lot of them are still using SQL. Okay. So one of the terms that you'll see on the ITF potentially is the DDL or the data definition language. And this is how we are able to add or modify the actual structure of our database. Okay, so creating the actual table, making changes to the table, dropping the table, which is another word for deleting the table, or creating an index of that table. So DDL is when we're actually defining how we're going to hold that information, whereas our DML, which is our data manipulation method, this is how we're actually going to make changes to the records or get information from those records by using a query. Okay, so in this case, we are going to insert into table name pets, update table name, you know, update pets, delete from pets, or select pet from table pets. And then it'll loop through and we can find all the individual um, records within the pets database or the, re the pets table within that database. So DDL is how we actually create our kind of like our container where the DML is the actual data manipul language, manipulation language where we're actually making changes to that data. Okay. Now it's very important when we're holding information, especially if it's PII or special information that could um, be used to identify a user, that we have very strict permissions. In our database uh, relational relational database management server has a lot of these kind of permissions and account based things built in. That's one of the features that those tools have. Okay, so we want to make sure that we have our account based control of who has access to what, and we want to kind of you know be cautious and. Um, utilize the principle of least privilege, which means if you don't need a user to have access to a certain part of either our, you know, data manipulation language or, you know, the actual how we're you know, structuring the data, then don't give them access to it. Okay, so make sure you're only giving access to who needs it. Okay. So you might be asking, well, TJ, that's great, but how do we access this information? Well, you can directly just go to something like you know, SQL or MySQL and, you know, assemble your query and get that information. Um, there are report builders that are out there. 
You might use something like PHP or Python or programmatic access. You might write a program that is able to connect to that database, or you can just build like a bigger front end and make it more GUI and then have our you know programming language kind of running behind the scenes. Okay, so that's how you actually access this data. So either manual or you are able to use the GUIs that are out there. And that's one thing that you tend to pay for um, you could create a database for free using something like MySQL, um, but you, you, you're, you're kind of limited to the type of like report builders and stuff that you have where something like Oral or Microsoft um, SQL, they have a lot of like the report builder, all the flashy stuff built in, and that's kind of what you pay for, okay? So the last thing that we need to talk about are the different tiers of application model, okay? So the way I like to think of these is... How many computers do you need to access the tool or to serve the tool? Okay, so a one tier application means that our user interface or the what our user interacts with is on the same computer as the back end. So all of that data or that database that we're creating, everything is hosted on the same computer. Okay, so that's our one tier. Now, as we move up to our two tier, this is where we probably have a server that has all of our data, but then on the client side, we have an application that fires up, it connects to that data, and it's able to make changes to that data or interact with that data, okay? A three tier is when we have our client that has our front end, which is our presentation, then we have maybe another computer that has all of our application running. So our presentation on our computer, our application or business logic on another server, and then our database is over here, okay? So by doing this, you're adding complexity, but you're also adding a level of scalability and security, right? Because now we can do backups of these individual machines and make sure that, you know, we are you know, maybe we're doing some type of load balancing with our database to make sure that, you know, the queries aren't just, you know, frying one hard drive. We're actually, you know, baking, you know, three or four servers that hold all that data. And then you have kind of that air traffic controller in the front with the, as the queries come in and saying, go here, go here, go here. It kind of makes it a lot faster instead of everything just being on one and people having to wait in line. And then we have our end tier, which means you might have something for like application security, you might have a reverse proxy, there might be, you know, 10 different uh, computers that are needed in order to host this um, database. Okay, so hopefully by the end of this lecture, you're able to describe what a database is and why databases are more um, kind of more useful when it comes to bigger projects than our flat files like Excel and CSVs. Uh, talk about how we kind of make this relationship between our data. Remember that example that we had where we had our customers, we had our books, and then we had our lending table. And then we're able to go query certain p bits and pieces of information to create you know, our application. And then finally, just that kind of review on those different application models, you know, one all the way up to end tier, where it just talks about the different computers that are used for, you know, serving up our application. So if you have absolutely any questions, please feel free to reach out tj at tjhouston.com. And again, I apologize for my short little, um, you know, break from recording videos. Um, but with the school year starting off, I'm 100% focused in the classroom. So um Actually, a student asked for this video. Uh, she's studying for ITF+, Plus, so I wanted to get it out there. But I will do my best to make some more for you guys. Thank you very much, and have a good day.